Welcome to Orbital Dynamics Part 16. Now that I've taught you the Keplerian orbital elements, I want to show you how to simulate orbits with STK. Here's a review of the orbital elements that I taught you. An orbit starts with a semi-major axis, which is essentially the size of the orbit, an eccentricity, which is the shape of the orbit, and then an Orbital ellipse can rotate along the argument of periapsis. Um, the plane can be tilted along an angle of inclination. And then the tilted, rotated ellipse can be twisted um, in the equatorial plane along the longitude of the ascending node. A company called AGI developed a software package called STK. It used to stand for Satellite Toolkit now stands for Systems Toolkit. And they offer a free version, which has a pretty extensive orbital simulation capability. If you click on this link, you can download it. Um, there's a license you have to download as well. And um, I'm going to show you in this part the uh, SDK simulation capability. And this is what it looks like when you run the program. STK. Again, it used to stand for Satellite Toolkit. It's now Systems Toolkit because it'll simulate things beyond satellite. So um, here's what the application looks like when you start it. If you click on Create a Scenario, I want to show you a simulation where I vary semi-major axis. And then I'm going to insert a default satellite. And I'll do that five times. And it's got both a 3D and a 2D window. And the satellites are all there, but the um, semi-major axis is coincident with the Earth radius. So I'm going to raise the semi-major axis. I'll make satellite one 7,500 kilometers. So like satellite to 8,500 kilometers, satellite 3, 9,500 kilometers, satellite 4, 10,500 kilometers, and satellite 5 is 11,500 kilometers. And you, here you can see the various altitudes. Then if I display this in full screen mode, you can more easily see the orbits. The timing of these follows Kepler's third law, where the period is proportional to the semi-major axis. And you can see the periods are all different. Here's what those orbits look like in uh, on a Mercator projection. And then if I go back to the 3D projection, I can tilt the Earth around. And these by default had an inclination so you can see there, the orbits are inclined relative to the equatorial plane. OK, now I want to create another scenario. This time, I'm going to show you what orbits look like with varying eccentricity. So I'll create five satellites. Now I want to make the semi-major axis 40,000 kilometers for all the orbits. And then notice the eccentricity was 0. This is 0 0.2. 40,000 kilometers, 0 0.4. 40,000 kilometers and 0 0.6. and 40,000 kilometers and 0 
and here's what those look like. Now, if the semi-major axis were smaller, the red orbit would go through the Earth, which STK will let you do, but it's not a valid orbit. So here's what these look like in full screen mode. Now, if I run this animation, and you can see I've got controls here, I can speed up the animation rate. The two anomalies differ and then they converge at the um, apogee and perigee points. And the periods of these orbits are all the same because the semi-major axes are all 40,000 kilometers. And then again, with SCK, I can rotate this, look at this from different perspectives. So here, I want to create another scenario to show you what different inclinations look like. And again, I'll insert five satellites. And then I'm going to make the semi-major axis 8,000 kilometers and zero inclination, 8,000 kilometers, and 20 degrees of inclination, 8,000 kilometers, and 40 degrees of inclination, 8,000 kilometers, and 60 degrees of inclination. and 8,000 kilometers and 80 degrees of inclination. And that's what those orbits look like. So again, in full screen mode, I can run this simulation. And again, because the semi-major axes of all these orbits is 8,000 kilometers, the periods are the same. The eccentricities are the same. It's just the inclination with respect to the Earth's equatorial plane that differs. And then this is kind of interesting on a 2D plot. You can see satellite one just orbits around the equator. Satellite five goes up into the northern hemisphere, then way down to the southern hemisphere, almost to the poles. Here I want to show you a different set of inclinations that create retrograde orbits. So I'll call this retrograde. And again, I'll create five satellites. And I'll set the semi-major axis to 8,000 kilometers. And inclination to 90, this is a polar orbit. And then 8,000 kilometers for satellite 2 and 110 degrees of inclination. 8,000 for satellite 3 and 130 degrees of inclination. 8,000 kilometers for satellite 4 and 150 degrees of inclination. And then 8,000 kilometers for satellite 5 and 170 degrees of inclination. And through the wonders of video editing, I'm going to delete a mysterious satellite 6. And here's what those look like in full screen. And I'm going to show you the equator of the Earth as a reference. And you can see the 90 degree inclination is straight up and down. But these are called retrograde orbits because they orbit counter to the rotation of the Earth.
And the previous inclinations that I showed you were prograde orbits because they orbited with the rotation of the Earth. And you can see how that looks like on a 2D Mercator projection. Now I want to create another scenario to show you a shift in the argument of perigee. And here I want to run this animation for a few more days. And I'll insert five satellites, or four satellites, excuse me. And now I'm going to raise the semi-major axis pretty high to 40,000 kilometers. I want to give the orbit an eccentricity of 0.8. And then this has an argument of perigee of zero degrees, 40,000 kilometers, 0 0.8. And I'm setting the inclination for all these to zero. And then 90 degrees for the argument of perigee. 40,000 kilometers, zero degrees of inclination. I'm sorry, 0 0.8 eccentricity, zero degrees of inclination. And 180 degrees, argument of perigee. And then 40,000 kilometers, 0 0.8, zero degrees of inclination and 270 degrees um, argu argument of perigee. And here's what that looks like. And in a full screen animation, these are all identical orbits except that the argument of perigee is shifted. And again, the ellipse is rotated in the xy plane about the z axis. And here's what that looks like on a 2D map. It doesn't look very interesting. Um, these are equatorial orbits. The 3D uh, is more interesting. OK, I'll create another scenario to show you the shift in the <clears throat> right ascension of the ascending node or the longitude of the ascending node. So again, I'll create five satellites. And I'm setting the semi-major axis to 8,000 kilometers. And I have to give these an inclination. So I'm arbitrarily choosing 60 degrees. This will have a ran of zero, 8,000 kilometers, inclination of 60, and a ran of 20. 8,000 kilometer semi-major axis, zero degrees of inclination, and a ran of 40, I'm sorry, 20. Eight thousand kilometers, sixty degrees of inclination, and here's a ran of sixty. And this is eighty. And I didn't make a mistake on satellite three, it should be 40. So I'll correct that and check four and five. And now you can see that the same orbits, same inclinations, but the orbits are twisted along the equatorial. And here's what these look like in full screen mode. And now I want to show you the Earth vernal equinox vector.
and I'll change the color to purple. So remember this rotation is with respect to that Earth vernal equinox vector. And so the right ascension of the ascending node is the twist in the orbit measured from the vernal equinox vector to the line of nodes on the orbit. And you can see otherwise the periods are the same, the argument of periapses are the same, the inclinations are the same. This is just a shift in the right ascension of the ascending node. Okay, um, now I want to go through the orbital elements one by one. The first degree of freedom I'm showing you here is the choice of semi-major axis. That dictates the size of the uh, ellipse, and it's a circle in this case. Next, I've given this orbit some eccentricity. And you can see I've got a vector, the red vector is for position. I'm showing the Earth vernal equinox vector and then the satellite periapsis vector. Okay, so I've given, I've chosen a semi-major axis and an eccentricity, two degrees of I want to, here I'm showing you that satellite toolkit does shading. The red part of the orbit is in the shadow of the Earth and the um, cyan part is in the sun. And here I've rotated the orbit in the xy plane about the z-axis, and so I've shifted the argument of periapsis. And you can see there's an angle between the periapsis vector and the Earth vernal equinox. Now I want to give the orbit some inclination. So I've shifted the periapsis. I've also tilted the orbit with respect to the equatorial plane. And you can see the satellite is ascending through the equatorial plane and descending. And so the point of ascension is the ascending node. And here I've twisted the orbit, so there's now an angle between the ascending node and the Earth vernal equinox vector. And so I've, shi I've shifted the right ascension of the ascending node. And then the last degree of freedom is the true anomaly, which is what the red position vector points at. So those are the six degrees of freedom that I talked to you about in the last part. So now I want to take you through these orbital elements in order uh, using STK. Here I'm going to show you how to construct an orbit with each of the Keplerian elements, and I'll go through them step by step. So I'm going to start by calling this Keplerian parameters, and I want to change the start time to 19 March because at the time of this recording it was one day after the vernal equinox, and I'll show you what that looks like. And then I want to insert one satellite. And then I'm going to set the semi-major axis to 20,000 kilometers. So, and I'll set the default inclination to zero. So this is the first degree of freedom. And you can see that orbit here. I'm going to display the equator and the prime meridian on the Earth. And then if I play this and speed it up a bit, you can see the Earth rotating. Then in uh, STK, I can display vectors. So here's the vernal equinox vector. This is our reference point in space from which we rotate orbits. And you can see that stays fixed even when the Earth rotates. 
And I'm going to add the um, position vector. And we've referred to this earlier as the true anomaly. So this is another degree of freedom for orbits, the position of the satellite in the orbit. And here I'm going to display the celestial grid. And so the Earth vernal equinox vector points to the zero, zero point on the grid. And you can see, because this animation started a little before the vernal equinox, the sun is going to line up right at the zero, zero point at the instant of the vernal equinox, which happened yesterday. All right, now get rid of the uh, celestial sphere grid. Now the next degree of freedom is the eccentricity. I'll give this orbit an eccentricity of 0.6. And now you can see this follows Kepler's second law. And here I'm going to show the equatorial plane for the Earth. And you can see thus far this orbit is in the equatorial plane. Now I'm going to rotate around the argument of perigee. So that now rotates the orbit with respect to the Earth vernal equinox. And I'm going to get rid of the equatorial plane so you can see that more clearly. So you can see there's an angle between the position and the Earth vernal equinox. But the position varies with time. All right, so I'll add the equatorial plane back. And now I'm going to give the orbit a 30 degree inclination. And now you can see the ellipse tilted with respect to the equatorial plane. Now, I want to add the line of nodes vector because the next rotation I'm going to do is the right ascension of the ascending node. And that's going to be an angle between the line of nodes and the Earth vernal equinox vector. So I'll turn off the equatorial plane. And then if I rotate round by 30 degrees, now you can see a 30 degree angle between the Earth vernal equinox vector and the satellite line of nodes. Okay, so I just constructed uh, an orbit with um, STK in three dimensional space. Okay, I want to show you some interesting orbits um, that should be sun synchronous. If you run this orbit wizard in STK, I can set uh, Keplerian parameters, but here I'm going to pick sun synchronous orbit. And I'm going to set the time of the descending node at about 6. And then I'm going to insert a few of these. So notice here I can change the altitude. And I'm going to talk more about how this sun synchronous um, orbit works from a physics perspective. But as I change the altitude, um, STK is automatically changing the inclination. OK, so I've got three um, altitudes. And that's altitude, not semi-major axis.
And let me make this a little bigger. So notice the inclinations are all a little different. And as I run this, look at the, um, the shadow line of the Earth. As these satellites orbit, they stay synchronized with the shadow line of the Earth, and that's why it's called the Sun Synchronous Orbit. I'll explain the physics around this um, in a later part, but uh, this is how you construct a Sun Synchronous Orbit in STK. Now I want to show you a geosynchronous orbit. So here I'll show you a geosynchronous orbit. Again, if I go into the orbit wizard, I can pick geosynchronous. And that'll be right off the coast of um, South America, and then I want to insert a second geosynchronous. And I'm going to move the uh, sub-satellite point so I'm off the coast of Africa. So I've got two satellites at geosynchronous orbit. So if I play this animation, you'll notice that the orbit is synchronized with the rotation of the Earth. And these satellites are orbiting in the equatorial plane. So I'm at, if I'm at the right altitude, the period of the orbit is one sidereal day. Um, and it's synchronized with the Earth. So here's another feature in satellite in uh, SDK. I can add sensors to satellite one and satellite two. And I want to change the cone half angle. So this is a hypothetical sensor, but it puts a projection on the Earth and likewise on both the three-dimensional Earth and the two-dimensional Mercator projection. And you can see these satellites t stay uh, fixed along the equator. This is a very common orbit. In fact, most satellites orbit in a geosynchronous orbit. Now, many times geosynchronous, these orbiting satellites um, their orbits will get a little off kilter. And so here I'm showing a 10 degree inclination, which is common if a satellite runs out of fuel and can't do orbit maintenance. And on the right, you can see the satellites with respect to the Earth are going up and down in little figure eights. And if I expand that, you can see that more clearly. And then with satellite one, if you wanted full coverage of the US, you don't get it um, at all times. And you can see on the left the inclination of the satellites. And if I display the um, equatorial grid, you can see how they're, those two orbits are inclined with respect to the equatorial plane. All right, so that's a geosynchronous orbit. It stays synchronized with the rotation of the Earth. Most satellites in orbit are in geosynchronous orbit. That's good for coverage around the equator and above and below, but it's not good for coverage in the high northern latitudes, like in um, vast parts of Russia. So a Russian scientist came up with a Mamaya orbit. In fact, Mamaya is his name. And this was a way to get coverage up into higher latitudes. So in this simulation, I'm showing you here, um, these are the parameters for a geosynchronous orbit. And the longitude of the ascending node is 60 degrees. So this covers parts of Russia, 
but there's a lot of parts that it doesn't cover. And here's a way to solve that. So these are three Molniya orbits, and I do them one at a time. So you can see that this dwells for about 12 hours over the northern latitudes. I'll do that again. Um, but this is a highly elliptical orbit. So the satellite dwells over the northern latitudes, and then when it descends, you need to launch another satellite. And then when it descends, satellite three, you need to launch satellite four. And I think it actually takes four satellites to make this work, but with three, you get fairly good coverage. And you can see how you get polar coverage. And you don't just get coverage of Russia, you get Canada as well. So where you can just use one geosynchronous satellite to get coverage of the US, if you want to get coverage of the normal latitudes, you need three or four satellites. And this is what it looks like on a 2D projection. You see the orbits don't match up perfectly. And then here are the Keplerian parameters, 26,500 kilometers. And these all vary a little bit. I don't think they actually need to be that precise. But if you want to run this simulation, just use these parameters. And note the orbital epoch for four is different from three, is different from two. That's why you saw them launching at different times. So here I want to show you a low Earth orbiting satellite. It's orbiting low so that it can um, get higher resolution uh, data from whatever sensors are on the satellite. But there is a challenge here. Notice that up in New England, the satellite had access. So if the satellite were collecting data, it would need to download the data periodically. And if this is a US satellite with ground stations in the US, you've only got about 10 to 15 minutes of access every time the satellite passes over. So for a satellite like this, there needs to be some online storage to store data when the satellite is not within view of a ground station. Otherwise, right there, it could download data. And it needs to download it in about 10 or 15 minutes. So another alternative is to launch a constellation of relays. And here I have two at geosynchronous orbit and one in a highly elliptical orbit. And here you can see you have near constant contact with one or two or even three of the relay satellites. So if you need to have real-time access, this is how you construct this. Much more expensive, though. In the previous case, you could launch one uh, remote sensing satellite. Here, you need two or three relays, as well as the remote sensing satellite. So the TDRS relays operate at geosynchronous orbit, and they provide connectivity for a whole range of NASA low-Earth orbiting satellites. and um, the International Space Station. So orbits are in three regimes. The green is geosynchronous. Um, the uh, magenta is highly elliptical. The orange is medium Earth orbit. And the yellow is low Earth orbit. OK, here I want to show you the GPS constellation, which here I want to show you the GPS constellation, which I can load um, pretty easily into STK. And this automatically loaded all the GPS satellites, and this is 
where they are today. And you can see, it's a little easier to see in the Mercator projection how they move. If I select all of them, I can go into the properties pane and I can display the orbits by clicking on that box. And so now you can see the orbits of all the GPS satellites. And there's 32 of them. And then if that's too busy, I can turn off all the satellites and select the individual ones that I want to see. So this SDK tool has got a lot of capabilities. And this is the free version. Okay, here what I want to show you is a way you can simulate orbits from um, an SDK standard object database. And here I'm going to show you the orbit of the International Space Station at the time that this video was made. So I know the ISS is number 25544. I could have searched for ISS. You get a lot of hits when you do that. Um, but here I just have inserted the ISS satellite. And I'm making this recording from Los Angeles. So I also want to put a pin in the, uh, the city where I'm coming from. And then I can use this access tool to determine when I would be able to see the International Space Station. And these are all the access times. So if I run this orbit simulation, you can see that at this point in time, the International Space Station is overhead in my location. Now, one nice feature of SCK Oh, and yeah, here I'm indicating on the orbital trace, yeah, a nice feature of SDK is that it can show uh, when the space station's in the light and in the dark. So you'll notice that SDK doesn't tell me that I've got visibility unless the uh, International Space Station is illuminated. So in these cases, there's no visibility points until we get right Oh, we have to wait another day. Right here, about when the sun is setting, right, you can't see the International Space Station if it's dark. You can only see it if the sun is shining on it. And SDK will um, generate the access times based on solar. Okay, so the takeaway from this, um, I wanted to show you how we can model the uh, six Kepularian elements in uh, SDK. And um, I don't have any affiliation with SDK. Um, I've used it quite extensively. If you're an orbit analyst, uh, you would have access to this tool. But um, the free version has a lot of capability. Um, and there's tutorials online. There's a lot more capability than what I've shown you. Um, so if you're interested in orbital dynamics, I would encourage you to download it and uh, use the free version.